Good, okay. All right, here we've got the Burks. The, and this is no, number 33 on the practice exam. And of course, every time you open it, there'll be different numbers, so different answers. But here's this version right here, number 33. You've got a family and they wanna go out. This was before you had to wear a mask, I guess. I haven't gone out now in almost a year, um, except to the store. The Burks pay their babysitters $5 an hour before 11 p.m. and $7.50 after 11 p.m. So the first thing you're gonna notice, the first two things actually, you're going to notice is that it's like time divides up into two different groups of hours. Hours before and hours after 11 p.m. Uh, professor, quick question real quick. Sure. Is there an advantage to using Gaussian elimination here as opposed to just using um, regular like substitution? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's. Give it a try. OK, you mean on this problem? Yeah, and problems yeah. like this where you set up two different equations. Uh, why not just solve for Y and just. Ex exactly. I agree with you. OK, um, if it's a, a, a word problem and it's only two lines, you know, two equations, then no, nah, you don't have to use Gaussian elimination. They're just try the people who wrote the book are just trying to get you to practice it because you do need it for the matrices. OK, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Good, just pop on up if you have more questions. Well, come on in. Come on, George. Don't just stay out there crying. Well, whatever. Cat doors open. There he comes. Yes. There you are. There you are. Now, can we see your cat? Well, yeah, if he jumps up here. Apparently, he doesn't find me interesting enough. He's going off into the other room. But I bet you he'll be here. He's wonderful. OK, now we've got hours before and after 11 p.m. And for the hours before 11 p.m., the sitter gets paid $5 an hour. And for the hours after 11 p.m., $7.50, which makes sense. And then we're told that the Burks go uh, go um, go out for four hours for only four hours in this version. All right, well, they go out for four hours and we can't assume it's two hours before 11 and two hours after. We really can't do that. Um, but they are going to pay 2750. So the total amount of money is 2750. The most important thing is there are two, two, two groups of hours. So you're going to have two equations. You're going to have the hours before 11 and the hours after 11. And that's going to be, according to this, a total of four hours. So I'll put that up here. So if I add the hours before and the hours after, that's going to be four hours. OK, now each of these hours before 11 
for each of those hours before 11, the Berks have to pay $5 each. So this is the total cost. Here you have hours. And here you have cost. All right, and for each of the hours after 11, the Berks are going to pay 750. And the total amount of money they pay is given in the second sentence, 2750. Now we're being asked what time, what time do they get home? Which means hours after 11. Unless the whole thing takes place before 11. We don't know, we don't know anything. We are just going to have these two equations to work with. Okay, so now, if you don't want to use Gaussian elimination, you can use substitution. Um, and that means you can solve for X or solve for Y. And then put that in for either X or Y here. Um, I'm going to stick with the um, um, instructions. But if you use elimination, as long as you have the right answer, that's great. OK, so I'm going to multiply just because it seems easier. I'm going to multiply the first equation. By negative 5 so that I can have negative 5x plus 5x is 0. My whole motivation there. So negative 5x plus negative 5x equals negative 20. And 5x plus 750, oh, that's Y. Plus 750Y is 2750. So now we add together here, um, and it looks to me like this is gonna be really easy. Um, negative 5x plus 5x is 0. And 750 minus 5 is 250. So 250y equals 750. Negative 20 plus 2750 is 750. And I divide by 250. And I divide by 250. And I drag my calculator up and say 750 divided by 250. Uh -uh. See, all I have to do is back up, hit the number again, it overwrites. And that's going to be three hours. So Y is going to be three hours after 11 o'clock. I have a question. Mm -hmm. This may be something you've gone over already, but um, the when you are multiplying the first row by negative five, I know this, I'm just con confused why you're doing it by negative five. I, okay, here, here's why. Okay so that I'll have a negative five in this position. That's all I care about because I decided to get rid of the X's. OK, I was confused because there have been other problems that it's been a different number and it's I mean, obviously a different number, but it, it's almost I think it's been a the Y position, too. So I was just confused, <laughs> but 
That makes sense. OK. OK, good. Thank you. Good. More questions. Now is the time. OK. Well, we're not quite done. Because what they're asking is what time did they get home? So we have to figure out higher math here. How many hours after 11 p.m.? Well, three hours. What does that mean? Well, if you start at 11 p.m., then time goes like this. 11 p.m., 12 a.m., 1 a.m., 2 a.m. If you're not on military time and they don't say they are. So, well, even then it would be. Okay, so anyway, this is one hour. And this is one hour. And this is one hour. Well, that's one, two, three hours. So three hours after 11 p.m. is 2 a.m. And so our friends got home at 2 a.m. Let's put that in and see what they say. Two colon dot dot. I mean zero zero. Check answer. All right. Can't believe it's letting me check the answer. Oh, your input is incorrect. Just put a single digit to. Ah, thank you. Your input is correct. Thank you for that hint. I do go over the work. I do go over every wrong problem. So if I were to see two colon zero zero there for this problem with those numbers, then and know that 2 a.m. is the right answer, I'd give you full credit. So don't worry about that. Can we do um, a matrices Gaussian elimination problem where we have to write the recipe? Like oh, the yes. Isn't Thank that a you. pain? Isn't yes. that a pain? Here it is. I keep, I keep getting something wrong. Well, then. Almost always it's an arithmetic error. Almost always. Yeah. But let's do this thing. Ah! Gee, well occurs. All right. There. That's good. We'll leave it there. Okay, so here's our matrix. Now, the first thing we're going to do is change. Well, it's not a matrix yet. This is just called a three by four system. We're going to change it to a matrix to solve it. We're going to use Gaussian elimination. So I'm going to a whole page here. So I write down the numbers. Negative two, negative nine, negative one. That's a one, that's a one, but the negative sign is in front. Negative nine, negative four, negative six, negative two, negative six, three, Nine, one, eight. And this is my matrix number one. Let's 
Okay, I'm going to double check this first. Negative 2, negative 4, 3. Negative 9, negative 6, 9. Negative 1, negative 2, 1. Negative 9, negative 6, 8. Okay, so far it's correct. Here's how I do, I mean, this is just my personal way of doing recipes, but it's not copyrighted, all right? It, it, you can come up with your own combinations. Now, I have to be able to add this position and this position together and get zero. That's my whole reason for choosing, well, for writing my recipe. And I also know that for this first location, my recipe has to include the, the rows, well, has to be the rows, row one plus row two. And now I'm going to figure out, do I need to multiply anything? Well, if I were to multiply row one by negative two, now notice all I care about is this number in row one. Negative two times negative two would be positive four. Then I could add positive four to negative four and get zero. So that would work for me. And that's why I want to multiply all the numbers in row one, because you can't just multiply one number. You've got to multiply all the numbers in row one by negative two. But all I care about is that position right there. It's absolutely all I care about and that position, and can I add that position and that position together to get a zero? It's all I want in the world right now. So I'll take negative two, row one, and row two. And I'm and gonna- this is gonna be our new row two, right? Yes, it is. So yeah, you could even write that, new row two. So negative two times row one, negative two times negative two is positive four. Negative two times negative nine is positive 18. Negative two times negative one is positive two. And negative two times negative nine is positive 18. Row two, I'm not gonna do anything to. So that will be negative four, negative six, negative two, negative six. Now I add vertically, four, my, four plus negative four is zero. 18 plus negative six is 12. Two plus negative two is zero. And 18 plus negative six is 12. And now I have my new row two. It's all, it's all very, very mechanical which can be so boring that you actually make arithmetic mistakes because it's hard to concentrate. This is my new row two. Okay, so zero, 12, zero, 12. Row one is gonna come down here. I copy row one from the matrix above, negative two, negative nine, negative one, 
negative nine, and row three. Three, nine, one, eight. My little trick here. Yeah. All right. Now, that's matrix two. And you might want to go over it again and make sure you didn't copy anything wrong. I don't trust myself at all. Better not to trust. Okay, now. Uh, Professor? Yes. Point of clarification here. Um, we're never going to be dividing with row operations, right? We're always going to be multiplying by fractions of some kind. Uh, uh, you mean up here? Uh, I mean with like the matrices that we're going to be dealing with in general. Uh, you will find yourself dividing sometime. Okay, I see. Usually toward the end. Gotcha. Like for instance, when we get to the end, I'm going to have 12y equals 12. I'll divide both sides by 12. Okay. Or you could do it now. You could divide every number up here by 12 and you would get zero, one, zero, one. Would that complicate matters or is it just easier to multiply by a fraction? Um, I prefer to wait, but you can go ahead and do it. Mm. I see, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I have a question. Um, sure. On one of the problems that we had for homework, um, Whenever it like whenever I got it wrong and it told me how to solve it, or when I asked for help, it said for the first row you multiply it times one fourth, like if the first number was negative four. So I found myself multiplying by fractions and I wound up with crazy stuff. Yeah, uh, you don't want to do that. In Gaussian elimination, you do that, um, but not here. Not in not. I mean. Gauss-Jordan elimination, you do that. But not in Gaussian elimination. OK, so we're not going to be doing any of that on the test or we no, will be? No, just do okay, it the way you. I do it. Yes, ma'am. What matters is the answers. So. Yeah, so. Gauss, the homework had us do Gauss-Jordan elimination, but we won't be doing or, it says Gaussian elimination or Gauss-Jordan. Well, I, I attempted doing it with uh, Gaussian elimination only, and the answers that I put in were incorrect and not because of arithmetic. Well, yeah, I had the same issue. Just do it this way, and you'll probably get it right if you don't make arithmetic mistakes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, here. OK, now I have to add row one. Here's my recipe. Row one plus row three. Row three. And get a new row three. which means I, my goal in life, my whole goal in life right now is to put a zero in this position. So I have to figure out how to add row one, that position, to row three, that position, together and get a zero. So looking at this, I can tell that two and three both go into six evenly, so if I were to multiply row one by positive three, that would give me a negative six in that position. And if I were to row, uh, multiply row three by positive two, I would get a positive six in that position. So I could add negative six to positive six and get zero. Now, to me, that's the easiest way to do it. 
but it would be possible to, I don't know, you could turn them into 12 if you wanted to. You could say, okay, um, multiply this by six, you'd get negative 12, multiply this by four, you'd get positive 12, and then you'd get a zero. You'd get larger numbers, but you could still get it correct. Get the answer correct. Anyway, I'm choosing to multiply row one by three and row three by two. So three times row one is I going to give me. Question. Yes. Um, why did you, why did you choose row one? Is it always going to be row one? That's kind of where I get messed up. Because I don't have a choice. Look what would happen if I chose row two. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Good. More questions. This is the time. Makes me happy. Okay. Three times row one. Three times negative two is negative six. Three times negative nine is negative 27. Three times negative one is negative three. And three times negative nine is negative 27. And two times row three is going to be two times three is six. Two times nine is 18. Two times one is two and two times eight is 16. And then I add them together. Negative six plus six is zero. Negative 27 plus 18 is negative nine. Negative three plus two is negative one. And negative 27 plus 16 is negative 11. Yeah, it is. Okay. And this is going to be my new row three. So, matrix number three. Row one, row two, row three. This guy is going down here to row three. Um, zero, negative nine, negative one, negative 11. And row one and row two, change color this time. Row one comes from immediately above. And row three is going to come from up, not row three, row two. Row two is going to come from immediately above. <clears throat> so, negative two, negative nine, negative one, negative nine, and zero, 12, zero, 12. I've got two zeros, I've got one zero to go. Now, in order to keep this zero, I again don't have any choice. I have to use row two and row three. Because if I used row one, I would get a number other than zero in that place. I have to keep this zero. So I'm going to be using row two and row three. 
is it safe to think about it like the first row that we use is going to be the column the corresponding column column so if it's like row two it'll be column two this is, is that how this is working um i, I wouldn't because you okay. use row two twice and it's when you use row two the first time it's column one right but the but whatever okay. works for you whatever works for you Now row one plus row three. Mnemonic devices, memory devices tend to be personal. So let's see. My concern is these numbers now, and I know that nine and 12 both go evenly into 36, and I can't think of a number smaller than that that both of these numbers would go into evenly. So, if I multiply row two by three, I'll get positive 36 here. And if I multiply row three by four, I'll get negative 36 there. So I will have 36 minus 36, and that'll be zero. So that's what I'm going to do. Row one, oops, excuse me, row two. I'm going to multiply row two by three and row three by four. And that will give me new row three again because I have to get two zeros there. Okay, so three times row two Three times zero is zero. Three times 12 is 36. Three times zero is zero. And three times 12 is 36. And four times row three. Four times zero is zero. Four times negative nine is negative 36. 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. And 4 times negative 11 is negative 44. That's right. Okay. So 0 plus 0 is 0. And 36 plus negative 36 is 0. And 0 plus negative 4 is negative 4. And 36 minus 44 is negative 12. Yes, it is. Okay, cool. So now this is new row three. And we are almost done with our matrices. Matrix number four, row one. Let me scroll this up. Are you sure that's a negative 12? Pa uh, I am pretty sure, actually. I think it's a negative. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. I was saying 36 minus 44, but that's not how we do it. Eight, right? Fourteen Make minus six is eight. Yes. So negative eight. But let's, yeah, definitely I would do this. Okay, thank you so much. Thirty-six minus forty-four. Negative eight. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, row one, row two, row three. So let me underline it again. You could be doing everything right, but then do something stupid like that. Did you know better? All right? But it happens. Stuff happens. 
Unfortunately, when stuff happens, there can be consequences. And And I don't, I guess I should continue to do my arrows just so I'll be consistent. Negative two, negative nine, negative one, negative nine, and row two, zero, 12, zero, 12. And then here's row three, and I do have my arrow going there. Now, now. Finally, row, uh, row one, we're going back to X, Y, and Z. Negative two X minus nine Y minus one Z equals negative nine. And row two is 12 y equals 12 and row 3 is negative 4z equals negative 8. And now we back solve. Starting with row 3. So Z equals positive two. And R two, row two, 12 Y equals 12. And so we know what Y is gonna equal. And then row one is going to be negative two X minus nine times one minus one times two equals negative nine. Negative two X minus nine minus two equals negative nine. So minus two x, negative two x minus 11 equals negative nine. Add 11 to both sides. That's zero. Negative two x equals two. So divide by negative two and divide by negative two. X equals negative one. And so we have our ordered triple, negative one, one, two. And so we go back over here Negative one, one, two, and everybody sweats. Whew. Okay. Take a Can look at a distance. On the road. One really quick, because I, I kind of lost you. I'm trying to follow the where you solve row one. 
Yes. I'm just trying to copy it down and figure out what you did. <laughs> okay, I had already found out that Z is two and Y is one. So when I write down um, row one, I'll have negative two X minus nine Y minus one Z equals negative nine. Now, Y is one and Z is two. So I put a one in where the Y would be and a two in where the Z would be. Negative nine times one is negative nine or minus nine and negative one times two is minus two. So that gives me the line negative two X minus nine minus two equals negative nine. Now, when I subtract nine and then I subtract another two, I've subtracted 11. So I have negative two X minus 11 equals negative nine. Then to isolate negative two X, I add 11 to both sides, which zeros the minus 11 out. So I'm left with just negative two X equals positive two. I divide both sides by negative two, and the negatives cancel out there, but they were before I zeroed them out. Negative two X divided by negative two, and two divided by negative two, which gave me X equals negative one. Does that help? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. OK, good. More, 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 more. It, it's all good when like you have this confusing voice. It's all calm. And so you take things one step at a time. But when I look at the beginning of the problem, like on my own sheet of paper, it's. My mind gets blown. Overwhelming. Yeah, exactly. But you got to fight it. I mean, how do astronauts flying around in space not get panicked? Like, you, have you seen that movie where they say, Houston, we have a problem? You notice how calm they stay, right? They know how to not get upset. Now, us civilians, we've got to learn how to not get upset. And practice is the answer. You want to practice until you're bored with it. It won't stop you from making arithmetic mistakes, but it'll stop you from being nervous. More, di <clears throat> more discussion. Okay. Want to go on? Request. I have a request. Okay. So it seems I was having a hard time with the f of x and the find. I'm going to call it fog. I know that's not what it is. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Composition of functions, yes. I have a hard time with that, those. Let's do this. Want to do that? Yes, please. OK. We'll do this and then we'll do another one that has a number in it. Assuming it's there. OK, this is number 30. We've got f of x equals x squared minus 6. And we've got g of x equals 3x 
minus three. And we're being asked to find F of G fog of X and G uh, uh sure, 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 sure. Scroll up there for a minute. G of F of X. Okay. So, there we go. This is F of G of X. You take G of X and put it into F and the movement is backwards like this. X goes into G and G of X goes into F and F acts as a shell. So if I come up here and just write F of X equals x squared minus 6. Then down here, I'll just stick g of x in for the x. And then I have to look and see what g of x is. Well, it's 3 of x minus uh, 3x minus 3. Now there's the setup. Okay, from here, you wanna work it correctly, but getting this step right is probably the most important. So if I square 3x minus three, I'll have 3x minus three times three x minus 3. And then that's what this is. We can't forget that minus 6 out on the end. So now, I am going to multiply this 3x by that 3x and by that minus 3. That's what I'm going to do first. So 3x times 3x is 9x squared. And 3x times minus 3 is minus 9x. Now, I'm going to take that minus 3 and multiply it by 3x and minus 3 and multiply it by minus 3. So I'll have minus 3 or negative 3 times 3x, that's minus 9x, and minus 3 times minus 3 is the same thing as negative 3 times negative 3, which is positive 9. Now this is what that is. And I can't forget my little minus six over here. So now I'm going to combine like terms, nine X squared minus nine X and then minus another nine X is minus 18 X. And then I have plus nine which is a constant, minus six, which is a constant, so I can combine them. Nine minus six is plus three. So this would be my F of G of X. And see what you get is another function.
Now I'm going to do g of f of x with the same idea in mind, but I really need to move it up so that I can see what f of x and g of x are. So I'm going to move up g of f of x. And that's going to be, now g is the outer shell. g of f of x. Now, if I come right above it and write g of x, I have g of x up here. It's 3x minus 3. Okay, so that means f of x will go in for the x's. So 3 times whatever f of x is minus 3. And so we'll have 3 times f of x. f of x is x squared minus 6. And then minus 3. And then in this one, all I have to do is distribute. 3x squared minus 18 minus 3. And that'll be 3 x squared minus 21. And that's what g of f of x equals. So let me pull out so we can look at the whole thing. So just about everything in math at this level is a step-by-step -step process. We call it algorithmic. Anything that's step-by-step -step is called algorithmic. You have an algorithm. This step, this step, this step, this step. Questions about this, discussion. Let's do one with a number if I included that. So let's see, we'll just go backwards. Yeah, right here. Is there another one? No. Okay. Ah, well, we have room to do it down here. Okay, this is number 29. And what we have is f of x equals 2x minus 1 and g of x equals x squared minus 4. Now we're being asked to find f of g of 1. Well, I'm going to write out what that is. F of g of 1. If that had been an x, I would have written f of g of x. But it's not, it's a 1. Now, what this means is, I have to find out what g of 1 is. So let's go up here and do it. So, g of 1 is going to be 1 squared minus 4, which is 1 minus 4, which is negative 3. So that means I'm looking for f of negative 3.
Well, that's not too bad. If f of x is 2x minus 1. Hang on, I'm like one step behind you. OK. Can you go over how you got the 1 squared minus 4 equals 1 again? OK, well, 1 squared is 1, right? 1 times 1? Well, so how did you, the g of 1 equals, how did you get the equals part up there on that? How did okay. you get the 1 squared minus 4? OK, g of x equals x squared minus 4. OK, so g of 1 is just going to put a 1 where the x is. OK, that's how. Oh. And then you got the equals 1 minus 4. Mm -hmm. 1 squared minus 4 is 1 minus 4. OK. Which is negative 3. So just to wrap my head around this, if it, it if it was any number besides 1, let's say it was like 13, I'd plug a 13 in that G 13. Uh -huh equals 13 squared because the 1 squared minus 4 is what g of x or g x. So x would always be 13 if they told me to find it of thir it, whatever it is of 13. Yeah, like that's where it gets me confused because like the ones, there's so many ones all the time. I don't know where the one is coming from or where it's going. The so, one is coming like, from there, which is is here. OK. That's where the one came from. Right there. So on the. Where you drew the arrow from the X squared minus four over to the G of one equals one squared minus four. Equals one minus. Four. Oh, OK. Equals one minus four equals negative three. I was going to ask how why you had equal signs, but I see now you multiply to one by one, right? Correct. Okay. Good, good thinking. Let me erase this before people think it has something to do with the problem. Good, good questions. All right, yeah, let me finish this now. So. I found out what G of one is. I found out it's negative three. So if fog one, okay, F of G of one equals F of G of one, that means G of one equals negative three. So I put a negative three in here. All I'm doing is finding F of negative three. So that means I put a negative three in for the X in f of x, so 2 times negative 3 minus 1 is going to be negative 6 minus 1, which is negative 7. You take away 6, you take away another one, you've taken away 7. There. I get so confused on the plugging them in back and forth. Yeah, it takes practice. I can't I can't think of anything other than practice that will cement that and make it seem normal which is what you want. You want it to just seem normal. So you do it over and over and over again.
you're learning a language. The math language. And will these notes be uploaded either today or tomorrow? Yep. I'm glad it's nonverbal. <laughs> For the most part. OK, I saw this and that usually gives people trouble too. Let's do that one. This is a piecewise defined function. Which just means you have one function. But it's broken up into three parts. There we go. All right, what this is all about is this. And it'll help make it clearer if you make yourself an X axis. Because what this says is you've got a function H of X and it's going to equal negative five X minus 12 for all the X numbers that are to the left of negative six. Okay, well, let's let negative six be right here. So over here to the left of negative six, make myself a little dashed line going up. That's what H of X equals over here kind of slanted there. And between negative six and five, where X can actually equal negative six. So here's a five. I'm gonna to try to make that straight up and down as good as I can. That's really bothering me. That is really, 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 really bothering me. Okay. I accidentally got some of these right last night. Oh no! But it was just by plugging numbers in, and then like I never could tell which one went where. Yeah, I I did the same thing. I'm like, well, I can just put it in, and then see right. what it gives me. Yeah, you have to kind of like guess where it's going to go, though, like in yep. which row of the functioning. If that's right. What call it. Draw yourself a picture, though. Not if you draw yourself a picture. See, you've got your x-axis divided up into three parts. Now, if you look at this, there's no doubt about what you're going to use. For all the numbers to the left of negative six, you use this. For all the numbers between negative six and five, you use that. For all the numbers to the right of five, you use that. And X is allowed to equal negative six here, and X is allowed to equal five for this one. See, that's absolutely necessary to me. The way I learn, I need pictures. If I can turn something into a picture, I got it. OK, so just to kind of re-solidify what you're telling me or us is that this is actually like the the four X is less than negative six is telling us that we will only use numbers there that are less than negative six. Got it. OK, it's a recipe. Huh? <laughs> it's a recipe. This is the recipe. 
for how much sugar you use, how much flour you use, and I don't know what else. Sugar, flour, what else is there in life? Eggs, I guess. And chocolate chips. Oh yeah, but we don't have a fourth line. Okay. Yeah, let me erase that. That's kind of stupid. Not well thought out. But that's the idea. You've got a function that's Divide it up into three separate subfunctions. This tells you when to use each part. Use this part for all the x's less than negative six. Use this part for all the x's between negative six and five, including negative six. And use this part for all the x's greater than five and equal to five. So then to answer these questions, all you have to do is figure out where they're located. Well, negative eight is located over to the left of negative six. And negative two is located in here. And five is located, excuse me, there and seven is located over here. And these are the numbers then that they're asking about, asking us to find, to evaluate the function for. So for h of negative 8, I'm going to use this part over here because negative 8 is over to the left of negative 6. Negative 5 times negative 8 minus 12. And negative 5 times negative 8 is positive 40 minus 12 is going to be 28. 10 minus 2 is 8, 3 minus 1 is 2. Yeah, okay, ne uh, positive 28. And h of negative 2 is just going to equal 5. Because for every number between negative 6 and 5, h of x equals 5. So if x is negative 5, h of x is 5. If h is negative, if, if at negative 2, h of x is going to equal 5. It's always going to equal 5 because there's no x over here to put the negative 2 in. Um, okay, h of 5. Here's 5. And h of x, I can use this. So h of 5 is going to equal 5 plus 8. And h of 7, well, I also use this one. So what you're going to have is that h of negative 8 equals 28, and h of negative 2 equals 5, 
and h of 5 equals 13, and h of 7 equals 15. 